this is what Scripture teaches us. And that is the title of this morning's message. And sometimes we think at hand, and we're not quite sure what that means, but quite simply, it means that the Lord is near. Amen? Amen. It means He is coming soon. It means He is approaching. Amen. Amen. He is approaching to come where? In our midst. And that is what it means when we say, the Lord is is at hand. He is at the door. Amen. Amen. So this morning, when we speak about the Lord being at hand, it can go one of two ways, according to Scripture. We can speak about God being near to us in terms of He binds up the brokenhearted, or we can speak about the fact that the Lord is soon returning. This morning, we will speak about both. Amen. Amen. Because right now he is near, but he's also approaching. Amen. There are two instances in the New Testament where we read that phrase, the Lord is at hand. And we'll unpack those two passages this morning. And what I want to show us is there are things in those passages that surround the phrase, the Lord is is at hand. Meaning, we shouldn't just be reading the Lord is at hand and say, amen, glory to God, hallelujah, and be on our way. No, we need to pay attention to what is surrounding that phrase. Amen. So let's begin this morning with James, the brother of our Lord. And turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. And we will read from verses 7 to 11. James tells us here from verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until when? Until the coming of the Lord. Amen. We can stop right there and we can preach a whole sermon. Because you see, we are patient up until when we run out of patience. But James says, no, be patient up until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. And here's our phrase. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, who is standing at the door? The judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, that your word is living and active, Lord. And my prayer this morning, Lord, is that each and every one who hears this word may be pierced in their very soul, Lord, that they may walk away, Lord, continually reminding themselves that you are indeed at hand. We pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. So James begins here, the Lord is at hand, and he highlights for us three points that surround that phrase. The first is the call to be patient. The second is that we are not to be grumbling with one another or against one another. And the third is to remain steadfast. Don't worry, we will unpack them a bit more just now. Just want to point those things out. There are three things that surround the phrase, the Lord is at hand. Of course, our brother Paul also uses that phrase, the Lord is is at hand. So please turn with me to our second passage this morning, Philippians chapter 4. 
and we'll read from verses 2 to 7. And in fact, while you turn there, this particular passage formed part of a Wednesday night Bible study a couple of weeks ago. And while I was presenting that evening, when I read the phrase, the Lord is at hand, I knew that is what I need to preach on. Amen. So the Lord is faithful. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 7. And uh, I tried to be fancy uh, here, Pastor. I got the Greek pronunciation in brackets here, so we'll see how well I do. Paul says here, I entreat Evodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to the Lord. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul adds an additional four points for us. He says, Unity, he says rejoicing or cheerfulness, he says reasonableness or gentleness, and then he calls us not to be anxious about anything. So in total, we have a nice biblical number of seven. We have seven points that surround the phrase in the New Testament, the Lord is at hand. And I'll put it to you this morning that these seven points weren't written down for the apostles or for the Holy Spirit for that matter to fill up a page. Amen? They were put there for your and my consideration. And more so, once we have considered it, it is put there for our application. Amen? Why do we apply these things? The Lord is at hand. So, between these two passages then, we have these seven areas that we can zoom into. Or to put it in a different way, seven potential blind spots in the church that the church needs to be aware of. And as such, I will now list them for us again in the negative so that we can see it in terms of a potential blind spot or area that requires our attention. So number one, is lack of patience, that is both towards one another and more so lack of patience towards the Lord's coming. Number two, grumbling with or complaining about fellow believers. Number three, not being steadfast in the Lord. Number four, not being in unity with our fellow believers. Number five, lack of joy, specifically that in the Lord. Number six, being unreasonable or harsh to those both inside as well as outside the church. And finally, number seven, allowing anxiety or our circumstances to rule our hearts. The Lord is at hand. Amen. So, I think it is fair to say that if these are seven potential blind spots, we need to be aware of it. Because what happens when you're driving in a car and there's a blind spot? You don't see what's coming, isn't it? The insurance companies need to be phoned. Why? Because there was an accident. So let us avoid these blind spots. So it's interesting to me, both Paul and James use the phrase, the Lord is at hand, in two specific ways in these two passages. One, in a sense of encouragement, don't be anxious, take everything to the Lord, he's at hand. In the other, in a way of warning, 
fix this. You are grumbling against your brother or your sister. Hey, the Lord is at hand. Amen. Amen. So what I want to show us this morning as we go through these seven points is it's not just these seven points. In fact, I will put it to you that the answer to every question is that phrase. The Lord is at hand. We must always remember that Jesus Christ, he sacrificed on the cross. Today in 2024, once you've accepted that salvation, you must understand that you have been saved. You are being saved. And you will be saved. Amen. So when we speak about the Lord being at hand, right now in your circumstance, he is near. Amen. But he's also coming back. He's also approaching. So let's take it into a different sense, into a negative sense. Sis Lerato and I, we don't see eye to eye. So because of that, I want to badmouth her because she's hurt me, because I'm still a child, you see. <laughs> I haven't left the playground. So what do I want to do? I want to go around and spread nonsense. Let me tell you what the Lord is at hand will do for you because it's the answer to everything. The moment you feel that come in your spirit, remind yourself, the Lord is at hand. Amen. The judge is at the door. In other words, the Lord is at hand encompasses everything in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Everything. In the beginning was who? The Word. Who is returning? The Word. It is the answer in our lives to every situation that we will find ourselves in. But before we apply this remedy in particular to these seven potential blind spots, I would like you to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 9. And we'll just look at the first six verses for now because I'd like to show you what could happen, what that accident could look like if the church ignores the word this morning. If the church ignores the fact that the Lord is at hand. So the prophet Jeremiah, also known as the weeping prophet, he wrote during the time of, of Judah, the southern kingdom. They were well on their way to be completely being carried off by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And he was broken hearted for the people. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah and the heart of the Lord were in sync. And what we'll read now in Jeremiah chapter 9 from verses 1 to 6 is that Jeremiah records God's lament, God's heart over the situation. Let's read from verse 1. The Lord speaking, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a traveler's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go away from them, for they are all adulterers, a company of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like a bow, Falsehood and not truth has grown strong in the land. They proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone beware of his neighbor, and put no trust in any brother, for every brother is a deceiver, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. 
heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit. They refuse to know me, declares the Lord. And we can go down to verse 23, please. We'll pick up in verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Last verse, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. What are we called to do in the New Testament? We are to have our hearts circumcised. What is one of the remedies to ensure that happens? Well, the Lord is at hand. Yes, this will be the fate of the church if we ignore God's word. So let's begin with the first one, the lack of patience towards the Lord's coming. I actually had a conversation with my mom last week or the week before, I don't remember. And um, I don't know why she was either reading the news on her phone or she saw the news on the TV, I'm not sure. But her response was, Jesus must just come back. He must come back now. Not tomorrow, now. Because in a sense, she's losing patience. Not with the Lord, but with this world. But there's a danger in that. You see, if we allow the problems of this world to weigh us down, we will in turn lose patience with the Lord. Because he will return, amen? The word says he will come at an appointed time. He's already got the appointment written down. The book has been closed. He is well aware where he must arrive, what time he must arrive, and how he must arrive. Amen? Amen. But the church needs to be patient. Why? Just like the prophet Jeremiah, his heart was like the Lord's heart for the people. Our hearts must be like the Lord's hearts. For who? The people. Amen. Turn with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3. If ever you feel like you are losing patience with the Lord's coming, just go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Read the whole chapter. So 2 Peter chapter 3, we'll read from verse 1. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And we'll stop there for now. I don't know what it is about church people, but we need to develop thicker skin. Yeah. Amen? Amen? We are so worried about what this one says and that one says, and then we are, <laughs> we become useless in the kingdom. Because you might wake up in the morning, Sister Pastor, you wake up in the morning, you're feeling good, you've had your quiet time with the Lord, you get in the car, you go to work, and you just feel that today I'm going to witness to somebody. Today is the day. No longer will I shy away. No longer will I be in fear. And you come across Auntie Michelle. And you're like, Auntie Michelle, <laughs> today I'm telling you about Jesus. But Auntie Michelle says something back to you that just floors you. Or she asks you a question that you don't quite have the answer to. And you feel despondent. In fact, she comes back and she says to you, your God has allowed this world to be the way it is. How can I follow him? So you leave. You leave despondent. The scoffer has won. 
isn't it? But we know because we will read the rest of 2 Peter chapter 3, why the Lord has, according to us, delayed. Isn't it? And we know, and let me just give you this as a side note there. If anyone ever says that to you, that your God did this, you must remind them, this says, no, 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 my God tells me that there's a God of this world who is responsible. And his name is Satan. You see, my God longs for each and every man, woman, and child to come to salvation, to live in the kingdom. My God has made a way where there seemed to be no way. It is your God who is killing the world. Amen. Just as a side note, extra bonus points. All right. So what happens when we allow these things to affect us? We become complacent. And it's quite a nice dictionary definition here for complacency. If someone is complacent, it means they are satisfied with the current situation and unconcerned with changing it often to a point of smugness. Well, Sister Pastor, you were schooled by Auntie Michelle, you weren't quite ready. You know what you do, you go back to the Lord. Teach me your ways, O Lord. Empower me in your spirit. You have given me a commission, I accept it. You have called me, I have answered, let me go. And you return. But complacency, when we allow the world to affect us, puts us into a place by, well, the pastor must go speak to. In other words, you have no desire to change the situation. In fact, she's no longer your problem, even though the Lord has placed her on your heart, she's now Pastor Kennedy's problem. We are complacent. And a complacent people is an ineffective people. In other words, you will have no desire to fulfill the calling that the Lord has placed upon your life. You see, when you lose patience, you will lose your fruit. You don't have to turn there. Luke chapter 8, verse 15, the parable of the sower. Jesus says, as for that that was sown in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and they bear fruit with Patience. Amen. Be patient towards the coming of the Lord. Why? The Lord is at hand. Another reason to exercise patience is the fact that the Lord is patient with us. Amen. Peter goes on to say in the same chapter in verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Why? Not wishing that any one should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So if you feel as if you are losing patience or the will to continue the good fight, simply remind yourself the Lord is at hand. Amen. Let's go to our second point. Grumbling with or complaining about fellow believers. This potential blind spot is widespread in the church. Even Jesus experienced this. So what did Jesus say? Hey, what I've gone through, you're going to go through, and sometimes more, isn't it? But he said, I don't leave you unempowered. I will ask the Father to send the comforter. Amen? Just by the by. So... Don't have to turn there. John chapter 6. I will just read from verse 57 here. Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue, right? In the gathering, as he taught at Capernaum, when many of his disciples heard it, they said to themselves, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, 
Uh, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? If it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted by the Father. And here's the important part. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. You see what happens when grumbling sets in. Pastor and I were talking yesterday. Why are there so many denominations? We're all following the same Jesus, but there are so many denominations. Why? I'll tell you why. Grumbling. That's why. Because this one wants it done this way, this one wants it done that way. Don't do the communion after the preaching. Do it before the preaching. Really? We find the most silly things to grumble about. But see what eventually happens is that you will turn your back on Jesus. Because remember, Christ is the head of what? The body, isn't it? If there is discord in grumbling or, or division within the body, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? The body becomes ineffective. And the head is grieved. So this body within the body wants to be its own body. They still claim Christ as the head, but in fact they are their own head. You see, this is what grumbling leads to. We often think, you see, I blame Hollywood, actually. (laughs) I blame those movies where you've got all the girlfriends, and it's not just the ladies that do this, the men are also guilty. But you've got, in the movies, you've got all the girlfriends in the the bar, sitting around the table, ordering martinis and what what, and they're just gossiping. But this one's actually their friend, but they are tearing her down. Why? Because it makes them feel good. That is the model of the enemy. The model of Jesus is to lift your brother higher. Isn't it? And what do you do when you lift your brother higher? You make yourself lower. Why? Because you are called to serve. Because if Jesus came to serve, you and I must serve. Do not grumble. Why? The Lord is at hand. Amen. Verse 70 of that same passage, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is of the devil? Don't be of the devil. Be one of the twelve. Amen. There will always be, and this is something important to point out, there will always be grumbling and division in the church. Always. Until the Lord comes, these things will exist. The false prophets will exist, the false teachers will exist, all these things will remain. The important thing is here, do not find yourself part of it. Amen? Remain in the body that the Lord wants you to be in, not the body of your own creation. So the next time gossip, slander, pride, or self-righteousness rises up within you, especially at the expense of your brother or sister in Christ, remind yourself what? The Lord is is at hand. Amen. Let's move on to number three. Not being steadfast in the Lord. And again, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 8, but this time I will read verse 13. Again, speaking of the seed that is sown. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. If you are not steadfast, that is, if you are not immovable in your faith, then you will fall away from the faith. 
Jesus points out in this parable that there was no root. In fact, if you want this parable explained nicely, go ask Uncle Moses. He experiences it all the time. Hey, Uncle Moses? The birds of the air come and they eat. <laughs> anyway, there's no root. If there's no root, the plant cannot be nourished. If the plant cannot get nourishment, the plant cannot grow. If the plant does not grow, the plant cannot bear fruit. Okay? Quite simple. Jesus tells us, what does he say? He says, abide in me. But you see, oh, you've got to love, you got to love God. He doesn't say abide in me and then full stop. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. As a side note, an extra bonus, we are taught in Scripture that marriage is two becoming one. Marriage is a picture of what is going to happen ultimately when the Lord returns. Because he will take unto himself a spotless bride. Amen? So even now he is saying, I am betrothed to you. I have chosen you. I have called you. Remain in me. I'm already remaining in you. It comes back to the same thing. You have been saved. You are being saved. You will be saved. Amen? As the branch, that is you and I, cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The next time you feel as if you have spiritually arrived, remember, without the vine you will die. Instead, we should remind ourselves daily of what? The Lord is at hand. For if we do that, then there will be no room in our hearts for evil to flourish. Remember who the king is and be steadfast as his servants. There is no danger for a believer to fall away if that believer is under the hand of the king. Likewise, being steadfast in the Lord allows us to experience the steadfast of Je- steadfastness of Jesus. As the psalmist wrote, how precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge under the shadow of your wing. Amen. Number four, not being in unity with your fellow believers. And I think for me personally, of all the points this morning, this is the one that I want us to to get the most. I want us to see it. So turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and we'll read from verse 1. Paul writes, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Now, We're doing the communion after the sermon. 
If you don't budge, we leave. Yeah, there's one God, but we can have two churches. No. There's one church. There's one church. And I'll put it to you guys this way. The closer we get to the Lord, what you will start seeing more and more is the real church coming together. Where people will cut the ties of denominations. They will cut the ties of their favorite preachers. They will cut the ties of anything that holds them back from fulfilling this word. That there is one. What does Jesus pray in John 17 with his high priestly prayer? He says, Father, make them two, three, four, one. As we are one. But there's an important thing I want to point out here. You see, because this potential blind spot causes much damage to the body. You see, unity in the spirit, and this is what I want to point out, is not unity for the sake of unity. Very important. Unity in the spirit is not unity for the sake of unity. Patrick, you like Buddha, I like Jesus. They're both quote-unquote gods. Ah, let's just be in unity. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Unity in the Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is the Spirit of truth. I cannot be in unison with error. So you see what's happening in the world today, our Catholic friends and some of our Pentecostal friends, they want all the religions to hold hands and sing Kumbaya in the name of unity. If you do that, you have fallen for a snare of the devil. Unity in the spirit means this is the truth. Jesus Christ is the one true Messiah. He died at Calvary, rose three days later, conquered death in Hades, sits at the right hand of the Father, and he is at hand then we can be in unity so if you believe that if you profess that we are in unity forget about when the communion is done forget about what songs are sung forget about it forget what pastor said it before forget what people wear it doesn't matter what binds us together unity of the spirit the truth Amen. Therefore, the real reason there's not unity in the body is because the people don't love the truth. If you love the truth, you'll be in unity with the truth, isn't it? In fact, Paul tells us point blank in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that a time is coming where great deception will befall this earth. And that includes the church. He says in verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, the coming of the lawless one, now you can call that the Antichrist, however you want to term it, the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, who with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, for they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Yes, Buddha, he looks very nice, a little statue. Very nice. You polish him, you rub his tummy. Very nice. He can't save you. He can't save you. Pick a God outside of Jesus Christ. Can't save you. Let us not compromise our faith. Unity in the spirit is in fact the opposite of that, is we stand our ground. We become immovable in our faith. You and I, we cannot sit at the same table because you do not profess my Lord and Savior. But let me tell you about it. Let me teach you your decision but we're not holding hands in the name of Jesus if Jesus is not proclaimed all around. Amen. 
It's a lack of unity. Not only hinders the work of the church, but as we've just read, can lead to destruction. We must be careful. We must strive for this unity. Why? The Lord is at hand. Don't wait until tomorrow. Do it today. The Lord is at hand. Don't be preoccupied with church politics. Rather be found doing the will of our Father in heaven. That includes unity in the truth. Number five, lack of joy. Specifically, that in the Lord. Christians cannot, I didn't say shouldn't, I said cannot, measure their joy based on earthly pleasure. No, where's our joy? In the Lord. All that the earth could ever offer you, here's a newsflash for you if you didn't read the whole New Testament, is going to be consumed by fire. It is going to be burned up. Jesus even tells you, do not store up these things where moth and flame are going to destroy. Rather, put your treasure where? In heaven. Because it is safe there. Down here, it will be lost. It will be destroyed. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We hope not in the government of national unity. Amen? Amen. If you have placed your hope in the government of national unity, I suggest you go back to Scripture and get on your knees. Because there is but one king, and the book of Daniel teaches us that it is he who appoints governments and kings. Amen? Amen? So where's your hope? Where's your joy? In the new laws that are being passed? In this that is happening? Oh, the petrol price is going down? but then tomorrow it's up again. Don't put your joy in the temporal things of the world. You will find no strength there. And I'm telling you now, a time is coming where you will require every ounce of strength. Because the closer the approach of Jesus is, the more wicked this world becomes. Because the more Christ calls, come, the more the world calls, come. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If your treasures are stored up in heaven, then from whence comes your joy? Heaven, isn't it? What does Paul say? You are citizens of the Republic of South Africa. No, you are citizens of heaven. You are part of the commonwealth of Israel. Amen? So the next time you feel like there's no joy, Remember, the Lord is at hand. It's, it's, in fact, this, 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 this is funny for me. When I was growing up, and my mom can tell you, I took chances left, right, and center, especially with her. But I never did it with my dad because I knew he would sort me out. So there was two things I remember very clearly growing up. On the negative aspect, I would get up to mischief, and all my mom had to remind me was, is your dad's going to be home in five minutes? <laughs> and just like that, change of attitude. On the other hand, in a more positive way, I looked forward to my dad coming home because I knew we were going to spend time together. You see, it doesn't matter which way it is. If you need a wake-up call to repent this morning, or if you are simply just longing for the Lord, both apply to the same phrase. The Lord is at hand. Number six, being unreasonable or harsh to those both in the church as well as outside the church. Onto Lavona and I know all about this. And the way I want to explain this to us this morning is with one word, and that is the word testimony. A testimony is not something that is reserved for a Sunday morning. A testimony isn't something where we call people up and say, does anyone have a testimony? And we give them a mic and they share a wonderful story that the Lord has done. That's 
just one aspect of testimony. No, a testimony is your everyday life, both inside and outside the church. Inside, let's begin. Your testimony inside the church is to encourage the saints of God. It is to edify the body of Christ. We don't stand up here to give a testimony to brag. We stand up here to give testimony to remind everyone else that God is still able. To remind everyone that if we, we, if we abide in him, he abides in us. What our testimony does to the body is it shows Jesus is on the throne. What our testimony does for the body is it gives them encouragement to return to the Lord. Our testimony in the church builds up the church. Amen. But what about outside the church? Well, outside the church, quite simply, your testimony shines the light of the gospel. Because, and pastors mentioned this before, it's been mentioned several times, in fact, from this pulpit. Why are you so happy? You've just lost a loved one. You've just got your car written off. You've just been kicked out of the house. You've just lost your job. You've just been diagnosed with a terminal illness. What is wrong with you? Ah, there's nothing wrong with me. My Lord is at hand. You see, your testimony outside the church shines the light of the gospel. So what does that have to do with being unreasonable or harsh? Well, if you are unreasonable or harsh in the church, you cannot encourage your fellow brothers and sisters. And if you are unreasonable and harsh outside the church, you have damaged your testimony. Amen? Amen? And if your testimony is damaged, the light of Christ is rejected in many instances. Remember, it is not you alone, it is you and Christ. I think sometimes we forget that he is in us and we are in him. Because the way we behave sometimes is not very Christ-like. Brother Patrick really needed encouragement but because I was in a bad mood, I gave him no encouragement. There was no testimony to build him up. I'm picking on to Michelle because you're on this side of Michelle. She's not a believer. Because I'm unreasonable and I'm harsh, how can I ever show her the love of Jesus? So we are called to not be these things. And what... What is, what is that phrase? Why? The Lord is at hand. The book of Revelation tells us point blank how we overcome the enemy. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So check yourself and may the Holy Spirit remind us. And lastly, allowing anxiety or circumstances to rule our hearts. Oh, how we struggle with this. <laughs> oh, how the people of God struggle with this. We feel, uh, I'm, I'm going to be blunt this morning. We feel anxious, we run to the doctor, we run to the chemist, we run to anything and everything that can just numb the pain but we never run to the Lord. And the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe, but we ignore that. Do not be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, take your requests and make them known to the Lord. You see, this can be difficult to achieve if we have already failed at the previous points. The opposite of anxiety isn't self-confidence. You see, that's a, a psychological thing that people will tell you. Just be confident. Get over the self No, no, no. The opposite of anxiety is confidence in the Lord. Amen. It is not confidence in yourself. 
Because if you are confident in yourself, guess what? You will fail yourself. Have you looked in the mirror lately? You're not very trustworthy. Think about it. You will fail yourself. And once you have failed yourself, that anxiety that you thought you could overcome in your own strength will take root in your heart. It will establish itself in your heart. And if it is established in your heart, who rules? Is it Christ or the anxiety? The only confidence that we are to have is in Christ Jesus. He will see us through our troubles and he will keep every promise in his word. When will we see all these things being fulfilled? At his coming. You see, it circles right back to being patient. Each and every one of these points work together for us to not be anxious for us to have confidence in the Lord. And why are these things important? So that we can feel better? No. So that we can shine our light as a testimony to the gospel. When will you feel better, Sister Pastor? You will feel better when the Lord wipes away each and every tear from your eyes. When will that happen? When he returns. What are you to do in the meantime? You are to do all things. Why? For the Lord is at hand. Let's go to our final passage this morning. We'll go back to 2 Peter chapter 3. And this time, because 2 Peter chapter 3 summarizes all these things for us to understand in the context of Jesus Christ returning, in the context of what we are to be doing while we wait patiently for him. So I would like to read the whole chapter. It's not that long. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Now, when I grew up, when someone said they were stirring, it was normally a bad thing. Okay? If you're stirring, you're stirring trouble. What Peter is saying here is he's taking that pup spoon, <laughs> that nice big wooden pup spoon, and he's sticking it through your ear, and he's giving you a good one of these, so you can scramble your brains, so that you can wake up, because he wants you to remember something, okay? So he's stirring this up by way of reminder that we must remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come, not might come, will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And what do they say? They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Where's your Lord? Where's your God? Where's your Jesus? But Peter says, for they deliberately overlook this one fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by no means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished, but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So just quickly, Peter's saying, these scoffers forget that God has already judged this planet once. And out of that, he saved Noah and his family. But the rest was swept away with water. It's already happened once. In the meantime, Jesus Christ has come, and he has made a way where there seemed to be no way. And right now, God wants as many people to find that way as possible, because there is a time where this earth will be destroyed yet again, but this time not by water, 
but by fire. And sometimes I think when we read that, we think, well, it's going to be a situation of Sodom and Gomorrah where it was brimstone and fire coming down. No, 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 no. By fire, it means the Lord himself will appear in the clouds. And the scripture teaches us that he is an all-consuming fire. He himself, by merely coming, will be that fire. Verse 8, do not overlook this one fact, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the one God of Israel, they are in eternity. We are bound by time. From their perspective, it's already happened in a sense. We are still waiting, patiently. But we've read this already, verse nine, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. Who are those some? That's you and I, us bound by time. But he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish and that all should reach repentance. Yes, all. Even that person that hates you. Even that person that has ruined your life. Even that person, and I will, I'm going to say this because I have a family member this has happened to. Even that person who has murdered a family member. You see, we don't like that. He's patient to all those people. Because each and every man and woman deserve an opportunity to be saved. Amen? Because we look at ourselves and we go, well, I'm not so bad. I deserve it. Yeah, I'm not so good either, but I'm not that bad. So Jesus, you can save me, but that one you must leave. Uh-uh. May he leave you if that is your attitude. Because scripture is clear. All should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. What is your job? Wait patiently and hasten his coming. How do we hasten his coming? Well, what is his heart? That all should reach repentance, isn't it? So what do we do to a hasten his coming? We call as many as we can to repentance. As our testimony is walked through this world, as the light of the gospel is shone, we say, come, there's one who wants you home. We hasten his coming by preaching the gospel. Verse 13, but according to his promise, we are also waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Amen? The kingdom of God. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them, of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 
Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Oh, church, the Lord is at hand. He is at the door. He is coming in the clouds. He will set foot upon this earth. He will rule and reign for all eternity. A kingdom not made by the, the, the hands of man. The lion from the tribe of Judah will roar. Therefore, lift up your eyes to the heavens. Why? For your redemption draws near. And when things get tough, when the cares of this life weigh down upon you, when you feel like you can no longer go on, what are you to remember? The Lord is at hand. Amen. Amen.